Wow, good morning. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, women's Bible study this Tuesday, 7 p.m. at the Stacy's. Uh, men's Bible study Tuesday, 7 p.m. at the Grants. Um, and as a reminder, we do not have visitors today. Matthew Bates and the family, they'll be here uh, next Sunday. Um, challenge for the month of January, memorize 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Uh, junior high youth group, Thursday, 6.30 p.m. And there will be a potluck following the assembly on Sunday, February 2nd, which is next Sunday. So. Yeah. There's a sign up out there. And there's a sign up out there uh, for the potluck. Yeah. Um, our scripture reading today is Ezekiel chapter 27. Ezekiel chapter 27. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, take up a lamentation over Tyre, and say to Tyre, who dwells at the entrance to the sea, merchant of the peoples to many coastlands, thus says the Lord God, O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your borders are in the heart of the seas. Your builders have perfected your beauty. They have made all your planks of fir trees from Sinar. And they have taken cedar from Lebanon to make a mass for you. Of oaks from Bashan, they have made your oars. With ivory, they have inlaid your deck of boxwood from the coastlands of Cyprus. Your sail was of fine embroidered linen from Egypt, so that it became your distinguishing mark. Your awning was blue, purple from the coastlands of Elisha. The inhabitants of Sidon, Sidon and Arvid were your rowers. Your wise men, O Tyre, were aboard, they were your pilots. The elders of Gabal and the, the, her wise men were with you, repairing your seams. All the ships of the sea and their sailors were with you in order to deal with your merchandise. Persia, Persia and Lud and Put were in your army, your men of war. They hung shield and helmet in you. They set forth your splendor. The sons of Arvid and your army were on your walls all around and the Gamadin were in your towers. They hung their shields on your walls all around. They perfected your beauty. Tarshish was your customer because the abundance of all kinds of wealth was silver, iron, tin, and lead. They paid for your wares. Javan, Tabal, and Meshech, they were your traders. With the lives of men and vessels of bronze, they paid for your merchandise. Those th from Beth Gomorrah have horses and war horses and mules for your war wares. The sons of Dedan were your, were your traders. Many coastlands were your markets. Ivory tusks and ebony they brought as your payment. Aram was your customer because of the abundance of your goods. They paid for your wares with emeralds, purple, and bordered work, fine linen, coral, and rubies. Judah and the land of Israel, they were your traders. With the wheat of Mineth, cakes, honey, oil, and balm, they paid for your merchandise. Damascus was your customer because of the abundance of your goods, because of the abundance of all the kinds of wealth, because of the wine of Helban and white wool. Vedan and Javan paid for your wares from Uzal. Wrought iron, cassia, and sweet cane were among your merchandise. So Dedan traded with you and saddle cloths for your riding, in Arabia and all the princes of Kedar. They were your customers for lambs, rams, and goats. For these they were your customers, the traders of Sheba and Ramah. They traded with you. They paid for your wares with the best of all kinds of spices, with all kinds of precious stones, and the gold of Haran, Cana, Eden, the traders of Sheba, Asher, and Chilmud traded with you. They traded with you in choice garments in the clothes in the clothes of blue and embroidered work and in carpets of many colors and they tightly wound cords which were among your merchandise. The ships of Tarshish were the carriers of your merchandise and you were filled and you were filled and were very glorious in the heart of the seas. Your rowers have brought you into great waters. The best wind has broken you in the heart of the seas. Your wealth, your wares, your merchandise, your sailors, and your pilots 
your repairs of seams, your dealers and merchandise, and all your men of war who are in you, with all your company that is in your midst, will fall into the heart of the seas on the day of your overthrow. At the sound of the cry of your pilots, the pasture lands will shake. All who handle the oar, the sailors, and all the pilots of the sea will come down from their ships. They will stand on the land, and they will make their voice heard over you, and will cry bitterly. They will cast dust on their heads. They will wallow in ashes, and they will make themselves bald for you, and gird themselves with sackcloth, and they will weep for you in bitterness of soul, with bitter mourning. Moreover, in their wailing, they will take up a lamentation for you, and lament, lament over you, who is like Tyre, like her who is silent in the midst of the sea. When your wares went out from the seas, you satisfied many peoples. With the abundance of your wealth and your merchandise, you enrich the kings of earth. Now that you are broken by the seas in the depths of the waters, your merchandise and all your company have fallen in the midst of you. All the inhabitants of the coastlands are appalled at you, and their kings are horribly afraid. They are troubled in continents. Their merchants among the peoples hiss at you. You have become terrified and you will cease to be forever. Andy, would you open us in prayer, please? Father, we think of Tyre and how they had everything, uh, just the long list of all the things they traded with and how they uh, wanted for nothing. And uh, it reminds me of uh, our country, how we are so wealthy. It reminds me of uh, even us individually, how we have so many of the things that we want. And because of that, we're often prone not to depend on you and to become prideful. I pray that you would help us to cultivate humility, that we would choose to trust in you in the day-to-day -day aspects of our life and not depend on the many things that you've blessed us with because we understand that those things come and go, but that you are forever. And I ask that you would help us to cultivate our fellowship with you, uh, choosing to focus on that instead of the things that are passing away, and help us again to be humble. I pray that you'd bless the teaching this morning, and that you would accept our praises. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You would take your hymnal and turn to hymn number 398. Hymn number 398, I Come to the Garden Alone. And let's stay seated. Let's listen to the first verse and prepare hearts for worship in the second hour. Hymn number 398. And this is one we haven't <coughs> sung in some time. If you'd stand, please. And uh, let's go ahead and sing uh, all, all three verses.
I recognize that as a picture of Napoleon Bonaparte, and this is from the History Channel. Immediately upon returning from his famed Egyptian military campaign in October 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte began scheming to overthrow the five-member directory that ruled France. With the support of several high-level co-conspirators, including two of the five directors, Napoleon arranged for a special legislative ses session to take place outside of Paris on November 10th. Using a combination of propaganda, bribery, and intimidation, he hoped to cajole the legislature into putting him in charge. The lower house instead bombarded him with abuse, 
chanting, Down with the dictator, and chased him from the chamber. But he managed to prevail anyway by convincing troops to clear the area, and then, in an attempt to preserve the veneer of constitutionality, convening a small, hand-picked group of legislatures, uh, legislators to abolish the directory and appoint him to a three-member consulate. Quickly becoming the first consulate, Napoleon completed his consolidation of power in 1804 when he crowned himself emperor. A little bit of history about Napoleon. And some of the things that we saw, uh, that we were looking at when I was reading that, we see some similar elements in this chapter of the Bible that we're going to be studying because this chapter, 2 Samuel 15, is about a coup. It's about a conspiracy that Absalom successfully engages in in order to displace his father David. A little bit of review as we get started. You remember that the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, that's where we're studying, and we've covered the last judge, Samuel, the first king, Saul. We discovered uh, that David was being trained by God in 1st Samuel 16 through 31, being prepared for this, this task of reigning as the new king, and then he was brought into power by God. God exalted David to the king, to the kingship, to the throne, not by his own strength, not by his own shrewdness, not by his own savvy, but by God, by God's power. And David waited a long time for that. You might remember the times that we studied where he had opportunities to take a shortcut, to kill Saul, to take the throne, but he didn't do it. Now, as we've studied 2 Samuel, we've seen the completion of that rise to power in consolidation and conquest. David has been successful. He's been blessed by God. God has been with him wherever he's gone. But in chapter 11, we see that things take a different turn for David. As he commits sin, he compromises his integrity. He takes someone's wife who does not belong to him. And as we've studied that more and more, we've seen the results of what happened in his life. He had a crime that he committed. He committed adultery and then he tried to cover it up and ended up murdering Uriah by the hand of the sons of Ammon. And Nathan was called by God to confront him about his sin. So Nathan calls him out on it. And what do we see in 2 Samuel 13? David had committed sexual sin and murder. And what's he reaping in his family life? Sexual sin and murder. And this results in one of his sons killing the other one and then fleeing to the land of Geshur. Now last week, when we were studying in 2 Samuel, we saw that Absalom, David's son, had been extradited from no man's land. And what had happened? At the beginning of chapter 14, Absalom was in Geshur, which is where his maternal grandfather was king. He was hiding out there, and there was popular uh, support to bring him back. And our friend Joab felt that way. He felt like Absalom should come back. Uh, Joab's motivation, I, I speculate that he did not really believe the Davidic covenant. He, um, he instead seems like he took steps to conserve his own power, his own position. He thought it was upon him to make sure that the next king was a Davidic king and that that would keep him in his position. So he, again, we see with Absalom, with Joab, the concept of selfish ambition and contrast that with David who had been brought up by God exalted by God and so what did Joab do he hired this wise woman from Tekoa and this woman went and played a part in front of David and she gave him an incomplete view of God she toyed with his emotions she skillfully convinced him to bring uh, Absalom back by using a story that Joab made up about how she had two sons, these were imaginary sons, but she had two sons that struggled in the field and one killed the other. She used this instance, this imaginary instance that was similar to something that happened in David's life to play with his emotions, to convince him. And in the end, uh, David ended up bringing Absalom back. But he did not fully embrace Absalom when he came back. Absalom stayed two long years at his own house. And he inquired of Joab. He sent messengers to Joab, not once, but three to or two times, in order to convince him to get an audience with the king. And when that didn't work, Absalom burned Joab's fields down to get his attention. And that did work, and Joab did come, 
and said, why are you burning my fields? And through that process, Absalom was able to get an audience with the king. And the last thing we saw in chapter 14 is David kissing Absalom, apparently being reconciled with his son. The big takeaway from this was, who do we listen to when we're making an important decision? You remember that David was given an incomplete picture of who God was by the woman from Tekoa, who said that God does not take away life, but God does take away life. God gives life and God takes it away. As Job said in the book of Job, or as Hannah said in the prayer of Hannah at the beginning of 1 Samuel. And so we see that David made this decision based on an incomplete idea of who God was, an incomplete presentation of what was at stake. Now what will we see in chapter 15? We're going to see the conspiracy of the prince. Absalom, one of the smarter people probably in the whole Old Testament, not necessarily wise, but smart, he's going to start schmoozing people. And then we're going to see the coup. And then we're going to see David on the run again. That seems like a familiar story, doesn't it? We spent a lot of time studying David on the run. Well, that's going to happen again. So let's get into it, starting in 2 Samuel 15. And we'll read the whole section, verses 1 through 6, and then have some comments. Now it came about, after this, that Absalom provided for himself a chariot and horses and fifty men as runners before him. Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. And when any man had a suit to come to the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you from? And he would say, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but no man listens to you on the part of the king. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. Then every man would ha- who has any suit or cause could come to me, and I would give him justice. And when a man came near to prostrate himself before him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. Now, what we have here is basically a course in how to run for political office. That's what's going on. Uh, But before we go there, let's remember a little bit of the background. You remember in chapter 14, we got a little bit of a a description of Absalom. Look at 14, verse 25, and I'll put it up on the board as well. This was how people thought of him before, even before he uh, came back. 14, 25, now in all Israel was no one as handsome as Absalom, so highly praised from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. There was no defect in him. When he cut the hair of his head, and it was at the end of every year that he cut it, for it was heavy on him, so he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels by the king's weight. That's about five pounds. So Absalom, uh, to Absalom there were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of beautiful appearance. And so we see that Absalom is like the kind of person and really the kind of family that you'd put on a political ad. You know, you can see them all there standing, smiling with the dog in the front yard, with the nice house. It's all framed up. That's how people thought of Absalom. He was well thought of. And David did not immediately reconcile with Absalom when Absalom came back. Now, I think that David was wrong to bring Absalom back anyway, but If he was going to bring him back, might as well have gone all the way. But that's not what he did. He waited two full years. And during that time, we could imagine how Absalom may have had some ill will toward David. And we know things about Absalom from studying him before. Remember that when that, when what happened to his sister Tamar, between Tamar and Amnon, he waited two full years to plot his revenge. So he's a schemer. He's a smart person. And we see the seeds of rebellion are starting to grow. And why is all this happening? Remember back, chapter 12, when Nathan was confronting David. What did David hear from Nathan? God said to David, Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. 
Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes, and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. So, what's really happening in 2 Samuel 15? Well, of course, Absalom is accountable for the decisions that he's making and the things he's doing, but this is coming about as judgment from God. God is allowing this to happen because of what David did. And one more question before we start to look at what Absalom did. What is a schmooze? What is schmoozing? What does that mean? Well, schmoozing is, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is to chat in a friendly and persuasive manner, especially so as to gain favor, business, or connections. So that's what we see that Absalom is doing here. He's employing these steps, and what is he doing? He's making himself look good, and he's making the current administration look bad. What did he do first? It says that he got a chariot and a horse and 50 men to go before him. So he hired some staff. It's kind of like an entourage, right? Except for instead of being with him or behind him, they would go before him. And wherever he went, he would go in style. This is like having a big limo. You know, that limo drives by with their whole parade, and you think someone really important just went by, except in this case, he had people going out in front of him, probably announcing, here comes Absalom, here comes Absalom. Everywhere he went, it was like a mobile PR firm. And what did he do next? He did some networking. He would rise early in the morning, go to the gate, Absalom wasn't lazy, and he would get up there, and the gate is the place in ancient cities where business was conducted, so this was like the courthouse, and he'd be there waiting for people. And when they'd come, uh, it was the custom at that time for the king to act as judge. They didn't have this distinction that we do between the judicial and the executive branches. So David would hear cases, as we heard him hearing a case from the woman of Tekoa in 2 Samuel 14. So that would happen. People would bring lawsuits to the king. And wherever you have lawsuits, you have people that are discontented. That's just the fact. That's how things are. And so Absalom used this to his advantage. They'd come and he'd call these people and he'd become personally acquainted with them. He'd see them in the gate and he'd ask them, where are you from? And they'd say, I'm from one of the tribes of Israel. And so in this way, doing some networking like this, he made acquaintances with people all over Israel. He laid this groundwork, this grassroots platform that he was going to run on. And then verses 3 and 4, let me read that again for you. Then Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but no man listens to you on the part of the king. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. Then every man who has a suit or cause could come to me, and I would give him justice. I heard recently uh, someone was saying there's an old phrase in law, if you have the, the truth, you bang the truth, and if you have the, uh, the law, you bang the law, and if you have nothing, you bang the table. <laughs> I think that's how it went. There's been a lot of table banging lately. And that's kind of what Absalom is doing. He's banging the table, right? He is, he is making something out of nothing. He's schmoozing people. And so when they come and they have these suits, he says, yeah, yeah, look, no one listens to you. No one cares about the little guy. No one cares about the little guy. No one cares about you. And then he says, I want you to imagine a world where me, this nice, friendly man that's talking to you, that everyone likes, that's very popular in all of Israel, imagine me. Judge Absalom, wouldn't you like it better if I was hearing your case? And so he's very persuasive. He's a schmooze. He's in this position. He's not in the hard position of actually being the judge, of actually having to determine right and wrong, because that would be more difficult. Probably have less friends then. It's easy to complain, but it's much harder to offer solutions. And the only solution that Absalom is offering at this point is himself. And then he made partners. Look again at verses 5 and 6. And when a man came to prostrate himself before him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. He was so well thought of that people would bow before him. After all, he was the natural heir to the throne. 
And that's part of the reason why there was a movement to bring him back in the first place. And so people would come, and when they'd come and bow down, he would grab them and kiss them. He was friendly with everybody. And now what Absalom is doing is obvious. We're talking about that same person that waited for two years to take revenge when his sister was wronged. That's what's happening here. He seems friendly and outgoing, but Absalom is really doing something, plotting something that is cold and heartless, the displacement of his own father. And it was effective. It says he stole away the hearts of the men of Israel right from under David's nose. I read this... uh, I thought this quote was interesting from Warren Wearsby. David had won the hearts of the people through sacrifice and service, but Absalom did it the easy way and the modern way by manufacturing an image of himself that the people couldn't resist. David was a hero. Absalom was only a celebrity. And that's Warren Wearsby in the Bible Exposition Commentary. See, Absalom was a... Um, insightful judge of people. He understood how to play people. He understood how to get what he wanted. And that's what he's all about, getting what he wants. You see Absalom as someone who didn't have a problem with reaching out and taking what he wanted. And in this case, what he wanted was to rule. And he understood something that the abolitionists in the 19th century understood. And that is, before political change, go after popular opinion. And so that's what he did. He went after popular opinion first so that when the groundwork was laid, there could be political change. And this is an interesting insight into what's going on with them. This is a lesson that we've learned over and over again in 1 and 2 Samuel. You see one man, Absalom, trying to exalt himself. And you contrast that with people like David or Jonathan, people who allowed God to run their lives Not perfectly, but they allowed God to exalt them, to be uh, their Lord. They trusted Him in that way. And that's something for each of us to think about. Do we trust God with our desires? What did Absalom want? He wanted to be king. Could he have trusted God with that desire? Could he have trusted that God would uh, would have maybe granted that, maybe not, and been okay with it? Could he have trusted that God's plan was better than his? He could have. He could have been like his father David. That's what David did all those long years, all those times when Saul was oppressing him and he had the opportunity to kill Saul. And did he do what Absalom did? Reach out and take what he wanted? No. So there's a strong contrast here and something for us to think about. Do we trust God with our desires? Then we get to the coup. And basically we have here what Absalom tells David and then what he told everyone else. Reading from verses 7 through 9. Now it came about at the end of 40 years that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed to the Lord in in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow while I was living at Geshur in Aram, saying, If the Lord shall indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. The king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. Now, there's a textual issue here. Uh, Some of your Bibles might say 40 years, and some of them say four. Uh, That is an issue with the ancient manuscripts, but four is probably the correct number because we know that David's reign was only 40 years, and so it's very difficult to see. what This couldn't have been David's 40th year of reigning, and it couldn't have been Absalom's 40th year of life because Absalom was born during the reign of David. So the correct answer is probably four And that's something that we could study further. But I'm going to move on. Uh, In any case, we see the same thing, the same pattern from Absalom as he's someone who can wait for years. And we see him lying in wait, and then he comes to David and he tells him he made a vow. Well, he was in Geshur. He was in exile. And now he wants to pay it. Now remember that Absalom was born in Hebron. That's where he wants to go. And that's where David's first capital was when the kingdom was still divided. You had... uh, Saul's son Ishbosheth in Mahanaim, and David in Hebron. And that was before David took over Jerusalem. So Absalom may have connections there, and this city has historical significance for their young dynasty. And what does Absalom do? He uses religion to cover for 
what he wants to do. He uses it as a deceptive tool. He claimed that he was serving God, but really he was serving his own interests. He wasn't going there to serve God. He was going there to start the coup. And David takes the bait. And again, we have to wonder, how is it that David seems like he was so often oblivious to the things that were going on with his own children? Things that should have been obvious. Look at uh, verse 10, and here's what Absalom told everyone else. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom is king in Hebron. Then two hundred men went with Absalom from Jerusalem, who were invited and went innocently, and they did not know anything. And Absalom sent to Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor, from his city Gilo, while he was offering the sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, and the people increased continually for Absalom. Now all that networking is going to pay off. Absalom stations men all over Israel with instructions. When they hear the trumpet, they're to announce that Absalom is king in Hebron. And, wow, Absalom must have been a very persuasive man that he has these people set up with this strategy. You can think of the times where he's got people to do things. Think back when he told his servants to kill his brother Amnon. That was a risky move. Or when he got his servants to uh, burn Joab's field. I wouldn't want to burn Joab's field. Joab is, doesn't seem like a guy to mess with. Uh, and here you see that he's gone all the way so far as stealing away the hearts of Israel, as planning this coup. And now all these people are going to join with him in rebellion against David. And then he has a bunch of important people that were with him, these 200 men that went innocent, innocently. And these guys didn't know what was going on, but they were probably the kind of people that you would want to be seen with when you were presenting yourself as king. Absalom was smart that way. He had people like that, and they didn't know what was happening. And Ahithophel, David's counselor, who was probably in on this whole thing. And so Absalom goes to Hebron. He does offer sacrifices there, but it's not for the reason that he told David. And the conspiracy is strong. The trap is laid. Absalom has succeeded. And now, what is David going to do? See, Absalom, Absalom in, a, in the world's eyes, he did what he needed to do, and he did it well. As, as far as the world is concerned, he, he did everything that he ought to have done. Why not? Just do it. Take what you want. Sinning can earn respect in the sight of the world, but God does not honor it. And now we enter into David on the run. Now we're going to see a pattern in these verses and basically what we see is David will speak or move or both and then he'll talk to some other people uh, he'll interact with someone in some way that's going to happen six times four in this chapter and two in the next chapter which we'll cover next week so first we see the escape he's going to he's going to talk with his servants and then they're going to move reading from verse 13 then a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. David said to all his ser servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, and let us flee, for otherwise none of us will escape from Absalom. Go in haste, or he will overtake us quickly, and bring down <coughs> calamity on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Then the king's servants said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king chooses. So the king went out, and all his household with him. But the king left ten concubines to keep the house. And so we see the escape. A messenger comes, a coup is on, it's taking place, and David reacts quickly. And instead of making a, a last stand, he, he decides to run. Now this is partially due to David's quick calculations. You have to remember that he is someone who is a seasoned uh, warrior and military commander. But it's interesting that he was completely blindsided by this. So on the one hand, he reacts quickly, and he's very wise in what he does. But on the other hand, he really didn't plan very much. For what was happening. So he talks to his staff and they tell him the people are all with Absalom, but then they also tell him we're with you. And that must have been a good thing to hear at that time. So David's smart and he reacts quickly, but also we see his motivation. And he actually said it in um, verse 14. He expressed a desire that they not strike the city with the edge of the sword. Now, in a normal conflict, David probably could have defended Jerusalem pretty well. 
but this wasn't a normal conflict. This was a coup, and there was no way of knowing who was on what side. And David did not want the city of Jerusalem, which he loved, to be destroyed. And so he decided if there was going to be a showdown, it would better to be somewhere else. And the servants respond with faith in their leader and obedience. They're ready to follow David anywhere. And you're going to see that. That's, this is the first time out of the six that people come to David, and they react to him in different ways. And as you see that, I want us to consider that at this time, David was God's anointed. Absalom was not. Now, if you look far into the future, you see that ultimately the, the anointed one of God is the Christ. And we have a similar decision before us every day that these people had then. And that is, that are we going to be faithful and loyal to Christ, even when it involves danger or shame? which it certainly involved for these people here. Or are we going to be disloyal? Are we going to follow other people? We each make that decision every day as Christians. And so we see that that applies to us. Uh, almost everyone left with David, except for ten concubines, which he left to manage the house, and that will be an important detail later. Let's continue on and we read about the warrior. Verse 17. The king went out and all the people with him, and they stopped at the last house. Now all his servants passed on beside him, all the Cherethites, all the Pelethites, and all the Gittites. Six hundred men who had come with him from Gath passed on before the king. Then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, Why will you also go with us? Return and remain with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile. Return to your own place. You came only yesterday, and shall I today make you wonder with us? Will I go where I will? Return and take your brothers. Uh, mercy and truth be with you. But Ittai answered the king and said, As the Lord lives, and as, my, and as my Lord the king lives, surely wherever my Lord the king may be, whether for life or, or for death or for life, there also your servant will be. Therefore David said to Ittai, Go and pass over. So Ittai the Gittite passed over with all his men and all the little ones who were with him. While all the country was weeping with a loud voice, all the people passed over. The king also passed over the brook Kidron, and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. And so they're stopping at the last house on the way out. And here you get a summary of who's going with them. David has the Cherethites and the Pelethites. That's David's bodyguard. This is an elite group of mercenaries who are led by uh, Benaiah, the, uh, the uh, son of Jehoiada. And also, David's merry men from Gath. You remember the people that were joining with him when he was on the run, first 200, and then a little more, and then a little more, and eventually he had 600 people? These men that had been with him when he was on the run the first time are ready to suit up and head out with him again. So you can see people being loyal to David. All these men, the Gittites, had been with him before, except for one. He spots Ittai, the Gittite. On the way out, they're passing by the last house. The Cherethites are walking ahead. The Pelethites are walking ahead. And David's old men from Gath are walking ahead. And he calls out this one, Ittai, the Gittite, and says, Hey! You know, and, and, and he tries to talk him out of going. He, he says, Look, like, this isn't really your fight. You know, I, I don't expect you. You just got here yesterday. I don't expect you to put it all on the line for me because... You just, you just got here. All these other guys, they've been with me forever. They know me, but you're new, and it doesn't seem reasonable to expect that you would have this kind of commitment to me. And what does Ittai say? Well, he responds with great loyalty. I'm reminded of the words of Ruth. You remember in, in the book of Ruth. Let's turn to Ruth chapter 1. And you remember what's happened is that Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, has lost her husband, lost her sons. And in Ruth chapter 1, verse 15, Naomi says to Ruth, Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to your pe her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. 
and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts me, uh, you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So you see this familiar theme with Ruth and with Ittai the Gittite. There doesn't seem to be any earthly reason why they would choose this person, why Ruth would choose Naomi, why Ittai would choose David. But what was Ruth choosing when she chose Naomi? She was choosing someone who belonged to the people of God. She was choosing Naomi's God. She was choosing not to go back to her gods. What was Ittai choosing when he chose David over Absalom? He was choosing God's expressed will. He was choosing God's anointed and not some usurper. And this is especially impressive in that these are Gentiles who we, we would totally understand if they had a completely different motivation. It reminds me of a girl I used to know at, at the church, uh, uh, used to be Lacey Chapel, now it's Lacey Bible Church. There was a girl that used to go there and her family was unbelievers, but she was a believer. And she used to go on her own to church every Sunday. And, and I can remember, you know, all of us at different times have struggled with making it to church on Sunday. Uh, and yet this person is a young person who you just wouldn't expect to have that kind of motivation. And a worldly person who's an immature believer. And yet she would go every Sunday. I remember that about her. And that's, that's kind of how I feel about Ittai and about Ruth. You see this motivation in their life, this intense loyalty toward God and his people. It's impressive. And there's also something else. Everyone wants to be a Christian when there's benefit. But what about when there's danger or shame? You see, Ittai here is it's not just theoretical for him, but he's taking a risk being with David. So David permits Ittai to stay with them, and Ittai's family moves along. And then we get the next group of people. So we had David's servants, and now we have Ittai the Gittite. And he's representative of the, all the Cherethites and the Pelethites and the Gittites. And then we have the priests, reading from verse 23. While all the country was weeping with a loud voice, all the people passed over. Uh, the king also passed over the brook Kidron, and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. Now behold, Zadok also came, and all the Levites with him, carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And they set down the ark of God, and Abiathar came up until all the people had finished passing from the city. The king said to Zadok, Return the ark of God to the city. If I find favor in the sight of the Lord, then he will bring me back again and, and show me both it and his habitation. But if he should say thus, I have no delight in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to me, or good to him. The king also said also to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace, and your two sons with you, your son Ahimaz and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. See, I am going to wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. Therefore, Zadok and Abiathar returned the ark of God to Jerusalem and remained there. So we see the priests. They come upon uh, David, and this is a morning march. They're headed east. And when I say morning, I, I don't mean early day. I mean it's a sad March. They're headed east toward the Mount of Olives, and it's a very sad time. And then Zadok arrives with the Levites. They come uh, with the Ark of the Covenant. And Abiathar, who had been in the wilderness with David, you remember that, Abi uh, that David used to inquire uh, of God with Abiathar back in the day. And this is a testament to David's care about the proper worship of God, that these men not only attempt to join him, but they apparently felt that the whole religious system ought to be uprooted and go with David there, and not stay in Jerusalem with Absalom. Now, when you think about David's response, though, that's not what he wants. And his response is one of faith in God, and his response is one that we can contrast with something else that happened in 1 Samuel. You remember in 1 Samuel when Hophni and Phinehas, the evil sons of Eli, were in battle with the Philistines, and what did they do? They hauled out the Ark of the Covenant as a good luck charm. They thought that that would win the day for them. But David understood something that those men didn't, is that when Zadok and Abiathar come, David says, 
he's not going to use the ark in that way because he understands that it's not the ark that's the good luck charm, but it's God who shows favor. It's God who humbles and exalts. And David's statement is one of faith. He didn't think that he could try to manipulate grace out of God, but instead he trusted God to do what was good in his sight. And he said, look, in a way, you could understand David as saying, I brought this on myself, and he had. It's a hard time. It's a hard time that he brought on himself, but it's still a hard time. And we can learn things about how to handle hard times by watching David here. What does he say? If it seems good to God, then he'll bring me back. And if not, then he won't. He's dealing with the discipline that he's receiving, and he's moving forward in faith. He's doing what he can do. He's not laying down and giving up, but he's trusting God to do what is right. And so he sets a meeting place with Zadok and Abiathar, and he sends them back to Jerusalem. And now Zadok and Abiathar are going to be there serving the Lord and be able to inform, keep David informed. And we have one more person, the counselor. Verse 30. And David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went, and his head was covered, and he walked barefoot. Then all the people who were with him each covered his head and went up weeping as well. Now someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray, make the counsel of Ahithophel foolishness. It happened as David was coming to the summit where God was worshipped, that behold, Hushai the archite met him with his coat torn and dust on his head. David said to him, If you pass over with me, then you will be a burden to me. But if you, want, if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in times past, so I will uh, now be your servant, then you can thwart the counsel of Ahithophel for me. Are not Zadok and Abiathar the priests with you there? So it shall be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall report to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. Behold, their two sons are with them there, Ahimaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send me everything that you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. So previously we were told that people were weeping as this is going on. And now in this verse we see that David is weeping too. He's mourning. This is truly a pitiful group of people being uh, exiled. The king is leaving and giving way to a new king who is taking control, who the people want. And bad times call for more bad news. David receives a message. His trusted counselor, this very wise man, Ahithophel, is with Absalom. And that caused him to fear. And that's, that's a cause for concern. This is a tremendous man, a powerful man, someone who had given him good counsel in times past. As a side note, Ahithophel is also Bathsheba's grandfather. It's possible that he did not uh, like what happened between Bathsheba and Uriah and David. And so what does David do in this case? We see something that he hasn't, we haven't seen David do this in a little while. This is something he does intermittently. Sometimes he does it, sometimes he doesn't. He prays. He prays to God. He calls out to God. He says, um, looking back at the text, O Lord, I pray, make the counsel of Ahithophel foolishness. Now, prayer isn't always like this, but in this case, God set an answer immediately. And his name was Hushai, the archite. This was a friend of David. The text specifically says David's friend. An archite is the name of a family that lived uh, in Ephraim. And David is, is happy to see Hushai, but he says, Look, you know, you, you, if you come with me, you'll be a burden. Hushai was maybe a little bit older. He says, but I, I have something that you can do. I have something that you can do. You can go and join Absalom's staff and counteract the counsel of Ahithophel. Now, he must have trusted Hushai quite a bit because he tells him everything. He tells him about the communication plan that he set up with Zadok and Abiathar. He tells them about their sons. And he trusts Hushai to inform. It, the text says that Hushai is David's friend. I guess times like these where you find out you know, who your friends really are. So David returns to the city, or Hushai returns to the city, and this happens about the same time that our dastardly villain, Absalom, is entering. And we're going to stop there. <laughs> we'll summarize, though. And we have a chart here of uh, 
six different people or groups of people. And I remember there's four of them in this chapter. We're going to do probably a shorter message next Sunday because the Bates will be here and I'm going to give Matthew a little bit of time to talk about his ministry. And next week we'll cover Ziba the servant and Shimi the Benjamite. But what do we learn from these people? What, what can we say about them? We can summarize. When David made the quick decision to leave, he talked to his servants and um, sometimes we think, well, is it really commendable that a servant did what they were told? Well, they could have not. They could have betrayed him to Absalom. They could have been unfaithful to David, but they were loyal and obedient to David and not to Absalom. So that's what they did. Uh, Ittai the Gittite. Here was someone who was given an opportunity to leave, and it just seems like he had every incentive to do so. But he was loyal to David in death or life, he says, no matter what. Then we have Zadok and Abiathar the priest. They offered to help David. They went back to be David's eyes and ears. And then we have Hushai, who's a friend of David. And wonderful thing to have friends in hard times. He was an answer to prayer, and he would thwart the counsel of Ahithophel and help Zadok and Abiathar keep David informed. Okay, so that's a summary of the four people. Now, what do we take out of all this? And, and to sum this up, we need to back up not just to the people that David interacted with and the exit from the city, but back up to the beginning of the chapter and think about Absalom. And now we contrast David and Absalom, and we look at all the people that we saw in the chapter I believe that the big idea is we need to learn to trust God with our desires. And this is something that David did in 1 Samuel. This is something that Absalom did not do in this chapter. He did not trust God with his desires. What happens when we trust God with our desires? Maybe he'll change them. Maybe he'll give us what, he want, what, we, what we want. But in any case, we don't sin to get what we want, which is what Absalom did. And there's an application there. We'll draw application from these three groups of people. Absalom, David, and then David's friends. First, from Absalom, sinning to get what we want may work in the short time, in the short term, uh, but is not honored by God. We, we live in a world of people who sin to get what they want. Maybe sin is what they want. Pleasure. People live for pleasure. Absalom uh, acted in this way, and it's not going to pan out for him in the long run. But we see from David, uh, we should trust God in hard times, even if those hard times, uh, we brought on those hard times by ourselves. David is really reaping the result of, of his own actions here. And yet he's moving forward, trusting God, trusting God that whatever happens, um, that it's going to be what's good in God's sight, and that's enough for him. And then finally, we get a, a very important application from David's friends. We should choose to be identified with God's anointed, even when it means shame or danger. And that is certainly a very timely message in today's world. And uh, something that uh, I, I think that Matthew Bates is going to elaborate a little bit on next week when we see him and his family. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this passage of scripture and... I see it as a, a challenge, a challenge to not let our own pleasures, our own desires govern our lives, but instead uh, to be faithful to you. We see that in this passage, we see people being faithful to your anointed, and we see people trying to usurp and displace your anointed. And we pray that we would cultivate in our lives the kind of thoughts and behaviors that are consistent with loyalty, um, even with the people Ittai the Gittite, or Ruth, in, in the book of Ruth, that seems like they did not have uh, much incentive, and yet they chose you anyway. They understood that you are good, and that following you is wonderful, and is the wisest choice. And we pray that every day you would renew that desire in us to follow you, to the point that we would even be willing to give up other desires that we have, to let you change the way that we think, the way that we live. We request these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
take your hymnals and turn to hymn number uh, 344. Hymn number 344, Be Thou My Vision. And uh, let's go ahead and stand. And uh, let's sing, um, let's go ahead and sing um, all four verses. Hymn number 344, and we'll start right in with the, start right in with the music. Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Amen. Thank you. Have a good Sunday.